3 Golden Eagles for War Thunder. Link in the description. Hello you sexy beasts, welcome back to War Thunder. Today we are taking a look at the Key 87, one of the only Japanese premium bundles. This aircraft was released just now in patch 1.63 and has a battle rating of 6.0. It's a tier 4 and features a super turbocharger. Now, what's a super turbocharger? Well, it essentially just means that you're going to have a good high altitude performance. In fact, this aircraft was originally designed to uh, stop the American bombing raids. Your armament consists of two 20mm cannons and two 30mm cannons mounted in the wings. Additionally, you can also carry bombs up to 250kg. However, such is not advised for an aircraft of this type. In terms of flight performance, the K87 is unlike any other Japanese aircraft. In fact, the thing I can most compare this aircraft to is the American P-47. This aircraft has an excellent energy retention, like honestly it can just keep its energy for days. It has indeed a better climb rate than the P-47, that's one of the problems that the P-47 has always suffered. And not only does it have a better climb rate than the P-47, it also gets an airspan on most of the maps. And this is kind of the issue with Japanese at the moment. Japanese army fighters usually fight together with Japanese naval fighters on most, of the, on most of their maps. And since most of the Japanese home maps are fought at sea and started out from carriers, the army fighters just get an air start. The rail engine can pull this thing pretty damn hard, resulting in a very good acceleration and top speed of up to 700 something kilometers per hour at high altitudes. In fact, this thing is so so fast at high altitudes, I've even managed to to keep up with the P-47M. Now, the roll rate is a bit of an issue. This aircraft being so heavy compared to other aircraft actually has a pretty low roll rate. And not only that, it is also quite unstable, especially when rolling and doing uh, slight maneuvers to keep up with enemies, or even whilst trying to fire your guns and rolling. It tends to shake around your aim points all over the place, which makes it almost impossible to get any kind of accurate shots in at long range, which is especially problematic with the kind of guns that you have equipped on this aircraft, but more on the guns on a later point. Now the roll rate is workable as long as the enemy doesn't really know where you are. Again, Spitfires do not have much of a problem since Spitfires don't really have the roll rate to evade you very effectively either, either way. But when you dive on an F-8F and you roll away, most of the time it's better to just try and uh, keep your energy up and gain back altitude and try for another run, rather than trying to roll into them, because they are always, always going to outroll you. Speaking of diving, this thing is one excellent little diving aircraft. It picks up speed extremely quickly in a dive, in fact catching P-47s yet again, and can go up to 870 kilometers per hour before you risk breaking your wings. Now the absolute maximum maximum that you can go is 900 kilometers per hour, that's when your wings are guaranteed to break, but even before that they can break. So I would suggest not going further than 807 kilometers per hour. And in fact, you can't really, because this aircraft does suffer from compression. After 800 kilometers per hour, your elevators start to not respond as well and if you don't pay attention, if you dive too, at too steep of an angle, you are going to pummel into the ground. And keep in mind this aircraft does not get air brakes. So if you go too fast, and you are going to go too fast given the excellent energy retention of this thing, just try and do wide circles around and don't worry, you're still going to catch those P-47s. Now when I said before that this aircraft is unlike any other Japanese aircraft in its playstyle, what I was meaning is the turn times. You know the usual Japanese aircraft, you got your Zeros, you got your Key 84s, they usually tend to turn pretty well, especially against American aircraft. This thing, not so much. If you're caught at low speed and low altitude, you are essentially dead. 
Your acceleration is good, but it's not good enough to really pull away from enemies. Your energy retention is good, but it won't really help you if you already are at lower energy than the enemy. And your turn time is just simply horrible at low speeds. That being said, however, at around 500 km per hour, I found this thing to actually turn pretty damn well. It cannot sustain the turn very, very well, because you will lose your energy and you will lose your speed very quickly in the turn. But I found that around 500 km per hour, you can actually keep up with Spitfires in a turn. Now, this might be due to them actually having fears of breaking their wings or even blacking out their pilots, but it is definitely a capable aircraft of uh, turning sharply into one enemy if such is needed. If you are, for example, diving on one and they turn sharply into your dive. Now, let's lose a couple of words on the armament, which I was kind of bashing before. Now, the rest of the aircraft is absolutely excellent. The Clambrate, together with the energy retention, works perfectly. It makes this thing into a just perfect energy fighter. This is the definition of an energy fighter. However, the guns can be kind of a hit or miss. As I mentioned before, you have two 20mm cannons and two 30mm cannons mounted on the wings. Now sadly, the 30mm cannons are actually mounted on the outer side of the wings, yes. I would rather prefer the 30 to, uh, to be a little closer to the fuselage to mitigate the recoil that they actually produce and more on that a little bit later. But sadly, the 20 is actually on the inside. Now, the guns have a total burst mass of around 7.5 kg per second, which does sound rather low. In fact, it is. It is lower than the F7F3, for example. And this is due to the rather slow uh, right of fire of the guns. Now, they have a pretty decent muzzle velocity, especially for the 30s, which means that you can actually snipe targets at longer ranges if you hit them. The problem is, even if you hit them, they tend to spark a little bit. Now, this might be just personal experience and experience with being used to different guns, because I have been told by people that these guns are actually some of the best guns that the Japanese gets, and Japanese tend to have bad guns, so I actually believe them. I actually believe that these guns might be the best guns that the Japanese gets. But in my experience, they still spark a lot, especially the 30s, I've been... It's actually really hit or miss. These 30s either have the potential to one-shot kill everything they hit, especially at close ranges, or you can put 600 rounds into the wing of a B-17 without it giving a single damn. That's the way these guns function. Now, that I did figure out that if you set your conversions just right and if you close in well enough and have all your guns hitting the target at once, then they can work, but you still have to do some sustained fire. But with the aiming cell that I have, it they don't really work. Now the aiming cell that I have is coming from my experience with aircraft like the Hunter, for example, where I cannot really sustain the lead, so what I do instead is saturate the area in front of the enemy with bullets. And that works great with uh, guns that have a high rate of fire that can just saturate the area with leads. And that's something that doesn't really work with the Ki-87. Given the low fire rate, you can't really saturate the area in front of the enemy. There's a good chance that the enemy is just going to fly in between your bursts. Maybe just receiving one or two hits, which, given on your ping, depending on your ping, can actually just spark off harmlessly. Now, I did mention before that the 30s were, mount were mounted on the outer wing side, and that is problematic once you run out of your 20s. In fact, the, run the 20mm cannons have a slightly higher rate of fire than the 30s and will run out before. Which leaves you with about 100 to 150 runs of 30mm cannons. Now, when they fire in sync, it's not much of a problem because they actually compensate the recoil of one another. But if you keep the fire down for a little bit longer or if you do bursts, your guns can desync. And once they desync, they will shake your aim all over the place, just pulling the aircraft from one side to the other, which is not very good when you try to go for those long-range shots when you're with your last rounds. So overall, the gun performance of the Ki-87 is workable, and you can indeed do head-ons, but given that the guns are mounted on the wings, you will need a high convergence, and I do recommend pulling out early because this thing is not too responsive with its maneuvers. Finally, we've talked about the overall accurate performance and the armament, but how is the resistance of this aircraft? How well does it take? damage. And, well, I'm glad to say, again, against the usual Japanese stigma and, again, just like the P-47, the Ki-87 is excellent at taking damage. Thanks to its radial engine, which is actually quite a small target in the first place, you don't get any kind of water cooling, which means that there's one less system that can 
go wrong. Only your oil can get hit, and even that hasn't really been hit in the games that I've been playing so far. The rail engine is quite resistant to damage. Now, of course, if you get hit too much, you will lose a lot of power. I've had situations where my, where my engine was red and I could only keep about 300 km per hour in the level flights. But it will still get you home. That's the beauty of this, of this engine, of this aircraft. It can just take damage and still bring you home. Even when every single component on your aircraft is red, you can still fly home. Now, don't expect, of course, to be very combat capable in such a state. But given the high dive speed and the energy retention, you have to simply dive to the deck and you're gone. Even with the damaged engine, you are gone, they're not going to catch up to you. One thing I have to warn you about when you are on the landing procedure is these brakes. These brakes are actually extremely strong compared to other aircraft, which makes this thing actually rather good at landing on shorter airstrips, but you do have the risk of flipping over and landing on your nose. Now, in most cases, that's not going to do too much, but if you hit it a little bit too hard, you might actually kill your pilot in the process. In summary, the Ki-87 is an excellent example of energy fighting. It goes completely against the usual Japanese playstyle, but complements its teams rather well, especially when paired with turn fighters. Is it worth the hefty price tag? That's for you to decide, really. But if you want to learn how to fly an American aircraft without having to suffer from American teams by your side, the Ki-87 is your alternative. Honestly, I absolutely love this thing, and, I'm, and I am going to use it as my aircraft of choice to grind for the Japanese tech tree. Hey! If you're interested in tank realistic modes, I've uploaded a range finding, aiming and binocular shooting guide with a sweet 2.5 km shot right at the start. Go to my channel and check it out. In fact, if you like what you're doing here, do subscribe and enable notifications for the channel. That way you'll never miss an upload. And hey, if you're nice and have any questions in the comments, I might even respond to you. But that is our time for today. Hopefully you did enjoy this video and granted it with a big green thumbs up. And I shall see you again next week. As always, my name is Michael Zwoom. Thanks for watching. You can lift your head up to the sky. Take a deeper breath and give it time. You can walk the path among the lines. With your shattered frame of mind. Who's that you could always stay? We can wait right here and play. Until somehow you can find a slightly better.